Listening to Anil Seth and Sam Harris talk about consciousness, I have to give them credit before I say what I say because I'm always inspired to think what I think after I hear what great minds say what they say. That's not to say that I don't think of things on my own that others might consider worthy. But without further ado, I've had this thought before, and again, it came when I was reading about Nagel's ideas in Sam Harris. Nagel said that consciousness is nothing if it isn't something that could describe what it would be like to be a bat, which if reduced means if you could have your consciousness put into that of a bat's and it wouldn't equate to annihilation, that is, if you could come out from being a bat and know what it was like, then we have a basis from which to say what consciousness is as opposed to what it is not in terms of saying why consciousness should be and why it is any different from being this tree. So the question being discussed now at this juncture in the podcast, which inspired me to stop, is why we should in fact have an issue such as what philosophers and neuroscientists and those concerned with consciousness call the hard problem. That is, why are we conscious? Well, when I read of Nagel's ideas in Sam Harris's book, Waking Up, and when I hear of this discussion now, I'm naturally drawn to a predisposition I have, which is to say, and I think they're actually touching on this, Anil Seth was touching on this in reference to another philosopher or neuroscientist whose name escapes me, and what I think they were touching on, and what I've already begun to think for a while now is we have to approach the hard problem from the perspective of saying maybe there isn't a hard problem. Um, Also in considering what I believe is the possible disproof of rebirth when considering Buddhism is the idea that we are just the amalgam of our senses and actually now I remember Sam actually said something to the extent of We have to consider that perhaps the way we are made would only result in consciousness. That is, if you have systems built in such a way as we are built and other sentient creatures are built, we shouldn't expect anything but consciousness, perhaps. And this is what I'm leaning towards. The philosophical and metaphysical and the spiritual from religion inspiration which led humanity before neuroscience to think that it required some kind of supernatural power, some spirit for us to be conscious, of course could be completely wrong. And the idea actually is wrong when you consider that we are conscious and there is no proof of any superpower. We actually have to work this backward. We have to unpack the idea that we already are conscious and the systems that make us make us conscious and devoid of any proof that there's some other reason for this, we have to accept that this is the natural course of things. We are to be conscious. Things are to be conscious. And in that light, the other species should be conscious. Before I formulated this way of telling what I'm thinking now, the first thought I had uh, was, we are mobile. It seems that consciousness is something that can be ascribed to mobile living systems. So as there are stellar systems and cosmological and geological and other ecological systems which are more or less immobile, it seems they don't require consciousness. So if you have a system, a biological system, which is going to follow the mandate of its component parts, something we might call survival, but which in a more less subjective point of view would just mean completing the fruition of its chemical and physics-oriented parts would be just the working of that system, well then consciousness is necessary or sentience is necessary for things, particularly species, which are going to be, for lack of a better word, predisposed to or slave to the mechanisms of their systems. 
I would love to have some comments from anybody who can manage to glean what the hell I'm trying to say, because even though I don't think I'm saying anything too complicated, especially for people who contemplate these issues, I do think that in order to explain these things properly and in a grammatical fashion that can be approached from all different directions, it tends to be verbose. Um, verbose. So that's my, uh, that's my thought on this. Number one, um, is there some metric or rubric to prove that things that seem to be conscious, and certainly we, are mobile, as opposed to rocks and trees and so on? People could make arguments for seeds and so on, and changes in glaciation. But independently mobile, mobile uh, things in the universe, particularly species, and it's easy for us to think of mammalian species, but we could think of avians and reptiles, these seem to need uh, sentience. And so it developed out of the mechanisms which made the neurochemical and physiological components that make up their beings. Next, why should we expect anything other than consciousness to be here in such systems? And finally, which I didn't allude to before, I think that sentience may be quite overrated. Not that I don't love being conscious and being alive, but that's beside the point. Um, going down the road which says that our, consci our consciousness is probably in fact an illusion of sorts, well, that illusion, I think, has been overrated by spirituality, religion, and our own incredulity as our philosophies and sciences advance at this phenomenon. But when we break it into its component parts, especially when we consider, among other people's ideas, Sam Harris's own idea of the lack of free will, maybe consciousness is not that fantastic. The fact that we speak and think and talk and the theory of no free will seems to indicate that these things are actually not in our conscious control, but it's an illusion that they are, may put us closer to the other species. The ones which Sam Harris and Anil Seth may be referencing as not actually having the lights on to the extent that we think we do.